Hi. Uh, this is a lecture for uh, History 111C, and I also would like to give you some guidelines for uh, your assignment on the, pa the, the paper you're going to be writing for Under a Cruel Star. Now, Under a Cruel Star, of course, is the story of Hida Margolis Cavalli, uh, a woman who uh, lived through the Nazi death camp. She was, she was a a Czech of Jewish origin, and she also lived through uh, communism. The story goes up uh, to 1968, uh, the Prague Spring of 1968. Well, the obvious thing in that book is that she lived through, you know, two different kinds of oppression, you know, the oppression of Nazism and the oppression of communism. Uh, but they, they were two very different things. And so if you look in your book, you know, of course, you know, your, your chapters 26 and 27 and 28, they deal with World War II and uh, the Cold War. Now, if you all remember, you know, a while back, you know, around about the time uh, when we first started having uh, these problems with COVID-19, you know, during spring break, I had assigned you all to read, uh, to, to watch the movie, The Peacemakers, that dealt with the uh, Treaty of Versailles uh, conference that took place in 1919 after the war ended. Now, that, that, that conference was very significant because it dealt with, because it dealt with the creation of the League of Nations, the United States emerged as a superpower. And uh, there was an attempt to really create an international order uh, that could avoid conflict in the future. Uh, the other thing that's really significant too is that the Russian Empire collapsed and eventually there was the emergence of what became the Soviet Union, uh, the first Marxist state. And so therefore, you know, I'd like to talk about Marxism. Now, of course, Marxism has its origin with Karl Marx. Uh, he wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848, you know, during the year of revolutions in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the goal the yeah. and, the, and the goal of, of, the, uh, uh, of Marxism was to transform society uh, from a capitalist society that, was op that operated on the profit mo mo motive to a society uh, in which uh, workers, the majority of the people, uh, control the means of production, and uh, things were done for, for the majority of people. Uh, so what we see is that in the period leading up to World War I, uh, socialism and Marxism, I mean, Marxism was a variety of socialism. Marx himself referred to it as scientific socialism because he argued that his vision of socialism was built on uh, scientific observations of how economies and societies had changed over a period of time. And, and his uh, vision of, uh, uh, of a Marxist society was what he felt would be the culmination of human development. But anyway, uh, at the end of World War I, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the end of World War I, the movement towards uh, socialism really underwent major changes. Uh, you know, prior to World War I, the, the socialist movement had been developing workers saw it as a way to have a more equitable society. Uh, during World War I, however, as a, you know, this was a very brutal war. We, I, I mentioned this before the semester over was over. I mean, not, not before the semester was over, but before we went to online classes. Uh, that, you know, World War I really uh, undermined Europe. They were not expecting such a brutal conflict. They were not expecting such a long conflict. And it really kind of destroyed the faith and progress, the faith in, in the European system. And one of the things we see is that uh, faith in socialism was kind of undermined, too. And this brought about some significant changes, although some of these changes were really kind of in action before the war started. Now, one of these changes that happened before the war started was uh, the development in Russia of the split in the, in, in the Marxist movement between the Mensheviks, who were actually the majority, although Menshevik mean, means minority in German, and the Bolsheviks, who were the minority, but Bolshevik actually means majority. Uh, the Bolshevik leadership under Lenin came to the notion that uh, revolution would not necessarily come on its own, but that it would develop most effectively if uh, there was an elite portion of uh, the socialist movement that would 
served to spearhead the revolution. And so that was their vision. So when World War I came up, this was the uh, Bolsheviks' opportunity to do this. Uh, the Bolsheviks, uh, many of whom, most of whom uh, had been exiled from Russia, were able to slip back into Russia uh, with the help of the Germans. And uh, they uh, were able to overthrow uh, the uh, attempt at a democratic government, and they were able to bring about a revolution. And so what we see is that by 1923 or so, we have the development of the Soviet Union. Now, the Bolshevik model was, was the, the one thing about, you have to say it was brutal. I mean, these folks did not mind killing folks. They did not mind cracking heads to achieve what they wanted. But in all fairness, uh, Russia had a very brutal political culture already. The, the czars had been brutal. Uh, the unification of Russia had been a brutal process. And so from that standpoint, uh, the brutality of the, of, of the Russian communists was not... Ex I mean, they were b basically doing what Russian political leaders had always been doing. Russia had a, had a brutal political culture. And, you know, they maintained that brutal political culture. Now, the thing that's significant, however, is that in the West, we see that... Uh, there were some other shifts. I mean, like, for instance, in Italy, Italy was kind of an interesting country because in Italy, uh, it, Italy had initially been an, an ally of the Germans and the Italians before the war. I mean, of, of the Germans and the Austrians before the war. But once the war started, they switched over to the side. There we go. That's... that's glare now. They switched over to the side of the uh, French and, and the British and the Russians. Now, what we see is that among certain socialists, you know, they, they, they really lost faith in the whole kind of socialist movement. Uh, patriotism became more important. And so when the war finally ended, you had a situation in Italy, like if y'all remember the movie The Peacemakers, they talk about the scene where the Italian prime minister is crying because uh, President Woodrow Wilson won't give him what he wants. He wanted territory in, in what will become Yugoslavia. Uh, a lot of these people are really disillusioned. You have a communist movement that's trying to have a revolution uh, in Italy like what happened in Russia. And we see that uh, nationalist groups kind of move in another direction. In particular, there was one young socialist, a fellow by the name of Benito Mussolini, who eventually developed what he referred to as fascism. And fascism was a very nationalistic movement uh, that really uh, took on kind of a radical guys, but in a lot of ways, you know, had fairly conservative goals. Uh, they wanted a strong national state, and they really, you know, wanted to kind of support kind of a macho uh kind of nationalism that really appealed to young men. And so what we see is that fascism uh, comes into power in Italy. Now, Germany, on the other hand, you know, they were the country that lost the war, but, you know, Germany really was kind of an interesting case because the Germans, although they lost the war, Germany was never occupied. Matter of fact, when the war ended, when the Germans surrendered, they were still occupying France. And so the German army really didn't feel like they had lost, although they, uh, although the German government surrendered. And so, therefore, it was a situation where the military was, was very bitter. They felt that they had done their part, but the government had let them down. And Adolf Hitler was an interesting fellow. He was not originally German. He was originally born in Austria, but during the war, you know, he fought for Germany. And you the thing about Germany and Austria, both German-speaking countries, and they were allied during the war. So, you know, moving from one to another was not, as big a switch as you might think. But what we see is that these young soldiers, uh, a lot of them were very strong nationalists like Mussolini, and uh, they really wanted to kind of regain the pride of, of their country. Now, the difference between Mussolini and Hitler, however, is that Hitler, in, a t in addition to being a very strong nationalist, well, was much more of an open racist. Now, racism was an issue in Europe altogether at this time,
Uh, the Italians, they had their own issues. I mean, they were the one European country that got defeated by Africans, Ethiopia, during the colonial period. And so, you know, one of the things that Mussolini would do would be to invade Ethiopia to kind of avenge the fact that they lost the war in 1896. But in the case of Hitler, Hitler's whole notion of nationalism was very much explicitly racial. And in particular, Hitler really blamed Jewish people for the faults of Germany. And so really from the very beginning, uh, Hitler made anti-Semitism, and in particular, the goal of genocide, the idea of destroying the Jewish population, as a central goal of the Nazi movement. And the Nazi uh, stands for, was, was a German uh, kind of a, a way of, of, of combining the, 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 the uh, initials for national and socialist, and, and, and in German it was pronounced Nazi. And so what we see is that the National Socialist Movement starts up after the war. Uh, there's an attempted coup uh, in Munich in 1924, but it's put down. And then for about five or six years, the Nazi Party is a pretty quiet party while the economy is pretty good. But once the economy collapses in the Great Depression, the Nazi movement becomes strong again. And, you know, the Nazi movement, the communist movement are fighting each other. But hit, but. Basically, the people in positions of power, they see Hitler as somebody they could work with. They knew he had been a loyal soldier. Uh, they saw communism as their greatest threat. Hitler was very much an anti-communist. And so they, they figured, hey, you know, look, if he comes into power, he can be a figurehead. He can help us fight off the communists. And, you know, more or less conservatives can stay in charge of the government. And so this happens and in, 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 uh, Hitler comes to power. But what we see is that very quickly, you know, he, he kills uh, his opposition. He even kills a lot of Nazis themselves uh, in what becomes known as the Night of the Long Knives. And by 1935, he enacts what becomes known as the Nuremberg Laws, which was a, a law code that was specifically designed uh, for discrimination against Jewish people. Now, one of the great ironies of this, however, is that Hitler actually sent researchers to the Library of Congress because... America had a long tradition of segregation laws. And he patterned the, the Nuremberg laws very much on the segregation laws that took place mainly in the South, but not exclusively in the South. I mean, uh, Southern Illinois, for instance, was segregated at that time. And so, you know, Hitler looked at those kind of laws and, and he used them as, as a model. Now, the other aspect of, of Nazism was that he wanted to regain territory or gain territory that he felt Germany desired. And so this eventually led to conflict with other European countries. And what we see is that by 1939, there was a war in Europe over control, uh, you know, that Germany started with the other countries in order to get control of the areas he felt they should have. Now, in the lead up to the war, as I said before, uh, Russia had become the Soviet Union. And what we see is that, you know, after the death of... Uh, 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 of Lenin in the 1920s, Joseph Stalin, uh, who was originally from the part of the, so of, of the Russian Empire of Georgia, which nowadays is an independent country, but at that time was part of the Russian Empire, he emerges as the head of the Communist Party. And he was very much, he wasn't really so much an ide ideologue, but he had come up, you know, as a terrorist, you know, he had been involved in revolutionary action. And he was very much a political infighter. And so he established control of the Soviet Union, and he basically maintained control by keeping people afraid and wiping out people that he felt were potential uh, rivals. And what Hedda Kovali uh, talks about in her book, what Hedda Magolius Kovali talks about in her book, you know, how her husband Rudolph is one of the people who is... Uh, framed and eventually executed, this was the kind of thing that Stalin did again and again and again uh, between the 1920s to his death in 1953 of having purges, you know, killing people that he, you know, who weren't, these people weren't, usually weren't actually working against the Russian government, but these were people that he looked at that he saw as threats that could potentially overshadow him. And so he found ways to get rid of them. And so... What we see is that uh, during Stalin's time, 
you know, he killed maybe eight or nine million people and put people in uh, the gulags, which was the, the prison system in Russia. And so what we have is a situation where Nazism and fascism, they were very, you know, they, I see it in nature, it's kind of like a, a, a great white shark and a killer whale. You know, if you don't know animals well, if you just looked at a great white shark and if you saw a killer whale, they look alike. They're both big. They both have a big fin on the top. They both have sharp teeth. They both will kill you. Although killer whales aren't that much into eating people. Uh, but, a whale is a whale. It's a mammal. It breathes air. Uh, big brain, very intelligent. You know, a shark is actually a pr pretty primitive fish. It doesn't even have real bones. It has cartilage. Uh, it can't hold still or it, it'll drown. And so even though they look alike, they're very different. And communism and, 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 and uh, Nazism are like that. Uh, both of them developed into in totalitarian systems. Uh, both of them developed into very brutal systems. But the ideological impulse between the two systems was very, very different. Uh, Marxism came out of a desire to have equality, a desire to uh, uh, create a fair world for workers. But once it actually became a, a system of government, the people in charge of it, you know, really became more interested in maintaining power than anything else. Nazism from the beginning, you know, was a system that uh, revolved around power, you know, uh, that developed out of resentment from a loss and was largely motivated by hate. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, the book uh, by, Hedda, uh, by Hedda Magalas, you know, starts off, you know, she's in the death camp. And, you know, by that time, the Nazis were losing the war. But the Nazi leadership was really dedicated to the idea of genocide. They wanted to wipe out the Jews. You know, even though they were losing the war, they were like, doggone it, we're going to kill as many Jews as we can before this war is over. That was their goal. And so even though they were losing, you know, that was still what they wanted to do above anything else. And so to that level, there was a certain amount of irrationality in Nazism. Uh, uh, they wanted power, but at the same time, they, they were driven by you know, what, what uh, Freud would call the edge, you know, a, a part of the brain that wasn't necessarily rational because it was really, you know, driven by a degree of hate that they kept pushing in this direction, you know, even when it probably would have made more sense to try to work out some way that they could survive. Although towards the end of the war, uh, the Allies had decided that, you know, they would only accept un unconditional surrender from the Nazis. They felt that... Uh, they were too much of a threat to the peace to be allowed to survive in any form. And But the point is, is that in the beginning of the book, when, when Hedda is escaping the death camps, you know, she's dealing with people who are really kind of nihilistic. In, in the sense, nihilism means that they don't really value life. They see no sense of a future. Uh, their one goal was to simply wipe out the people they hated, and that's what they did. And so Nazism was very upfront in what it sought to achieve. And, you know, it was, it was destructive. It didn't have a building aspect to it. Now, once the war is over, the Nazis are removed. And, you know, she really gives the example of seeing the SS officer, you know, shot to death in a pool of blood on the street. How a day or so earlier, he would have, you know, he would have been somebody that she would have been afraid of, but now he was gone. I mean, at that level, Nazism was kind of wiped out. And for a long time, didn't leave an imprint. I mean, nowadays in Europe, you see kind of right-wing authoritarianism coming back, but uh, it's not exactly coming back as Nazism. I don't, I don't think you're going to see people strutting around in uniforms, a goose step in, uh, you know, doing that kind of thing. But uh, I'd say some of the governments, I think, for instance, like the government in Hungary right now that has become a government of decree, you know, it's kind of moved back in that direction. But the communist movement takes over in Hungary. And, you know, as Hedda says, you know, this, is, this was a movement that very much, you know, portrayed itself as a workers' movement. It portrayed themselves as a movement that was going to be fair and equitable to the people, uh, which was why her husband was very much into it. You know, uh, historically, there had been a lot of Jewish people involved in Marxism. I mean, Marx himself was a Jew. And, you know, this made sense because historically, these folks had been discriminated against. They had not had full rights in Europe. And so the idea of being attracted to an art, to a movement that wanted equality made sense for them. However, 
the communist system that came into uh, the Czech Republic, or, or Czech, Czechoslovakia, because at that time it was still Czechoslovakia, which was a combination of, of, the, Czech, uh, of the Czech people and Slovakia. Like at one point she talks about her son staying with relatives. When he comes back, he has a, a, a Slovakian accent. That's because they spoke the Slovakian language over in Bratislava, where he was, and, and which was different from the Czech language in Prague. Uh, where, where, where Hedda Cavalli spent most of her time. But anyway, when these people took over, uh, you know, although they talked about a revolutionary ideology, I mean, really, it was a very bureaucratic system. It was a system that really revolved around people in power trying to keep power. And uh, what they did, they wiped out people that they felt were talented or who had ability, you know, which was why uh, Hedda Margolis's husband, Rudolf, was targeted. Now, one of the things that popped up from this, as she mentioned, was that, you know, anti-Semitism, you know, had a way of coming back. And, and again, you know, it's not an accident that uh, in the Slansky trial, you know, Slansky and, you know, Rudolf Margolis, all these guys, they were Jewish because the anti-Semitism still existed. But it's important to note that the Czech government was not an explicitly anti-Semitic government like the Nazi government. I mean, that was not their... I mean, Hitler, you know, when he wrote Mein Kampf, you know, he explicitly said, you know, hey, the world would be better if we get rid of Jews. Uh, you don't see that in communism. You know, communism uh, portrayed itself as an egalitarian, a uh, non-racial system. Uh, and I, I do believe that, you know, uh, a, a communist revolutionaries, many of them, they had that goal. However, the, the fact of the matter is that in human nature, you know, racism and prejudice, you know, even though people a lot of times, you know, talk against them. Those things have a way of popping up, you know, even when people have good intentions. Um, and, you know, the system in, in, in Eastern Europe, that was how it worked. And so what we see is that although the revolutionary system, although Marxism comes to Czech, the Czech Republic, in reality, it's basically just Russia taking over Eastern Europe and setting up Eastern Europe as a buffer to keep away America and other Western powers that it sees as threats uh, to the Soviet system. Ultimately, that's why in 1968, when you see, you know, towards the end of the book, when you see the Czechs trying to go into a more open system, while the Russians come in and, you know, with, with, with the other members of the Warsaw Pact and put them down because ultimately they don't want these countries to be independent. They want these countries to stay as buffers between them and the West. And this kind of government, you know, did not really encourage people who really wanted to have change, who really want to improve society. You know, as uh, Hedda Cavalli talks about in the book, you know, it, it basically brings about people who are really just interested in maintaining power. And, you know, that's why her husband ends up becoming a victim. Well, anyway, I just wanted to explain that to you all so you all can get a little bit more out of the book. Now, as for the paper itself, I want you all to write a paper about five pages, and I really want you all to focus on her life, uh, what were the issues that she had to deal with, you know, how did she perceive these ideologies, uh, how did she survive, and, you know, be, be, you know, more than, you know, you, you're more than welcome to look in the book's chapters 24, 25, 26, uh, and look at your textbook in order to help you craft a paper. Now, this is not a research paper. You don't have to have footnotes or anything because you're just using, you know, your one book, you know, un under, under a cruel star and your textbook as a backup. So I, you don't need footnotes and that sort of thing. Uh, if you want to have a citation, you can put something, you can do MLA style with brackets and, and cite the book and a page number. But, you know, you're not doing a research paper, so you don't need a bibliography and footnotes and that kind of thing. But like I say, make it a five-page paper. You know, focus on how she lived, you know, focus on how she dealt with these two systems. And uh, let's get the paper in uh, by the end of the month, by April the 30th, 
And that's going to really function as your final grade. Now, also remember to, to uh, do those discussion questions that I have for you. I'm going to count that as a test, too. And that will pretty much be the end of the semester for you. Uh, you know, like I said, unfortunately, because of the pandemic we're dealing with, the semester has not ended the way it would have normally ended. But hopefully, you know, you all have been able to get this information and you've been able to learn some history in the class. And you've come out of this knowing more than you did coming in. And so please be safe, you know, stay at home as much as possible. Uh, you know, this is something we don't have a cure for. Our only uh, defense is soap and uh, uh, sanitizer and that kind of thing. And, you know, distancing ourselves distancing ourselves. So let's do that. Be safe. And if you're taking classes this summer, you know, you'll be online and hopefully things will be good enough that we can be back in the classroom this fall. Uh, have a good summer as much as possible under the circumstances. Take care.